My investigation has brought me to the west coast of the Isle of Man. I'm here on the shoulder of a windswept dam 750 feet above sea level on the trail of a remarkable story. Below me in the distance, the sea glistens. A, a, a stony path parts from the road and winds up among the hills towards the farmhouse of Dawlish Cashin. Uh, the, the landscape is bleak and monotonous. Above me are the central hills of the island, as it were, brooding over a mystery. A strange trail has led me here. Rumours of a mysterious creature. But save for the wind, rising off the Atlantic, all is silent. Adrian, lunch. Oh, for heavens. Lunch is ready. Auntie. What? I told you I'm recording. Oh, but it's your favorite Welsh rabbit. Oh, all right. <laughs> Oh, somebody phoned from the BBC. What? what? Why didn't you tell me? But you said you didn't want to be disturbed. But if it's the BBC, you must tell me at once. Of it's course, important. But what did they say? <laughs> it was someone having a joke, I think. They said it was about a talking mongoose. But that's what I think. What? Oh, never mind. When it finally appears to the traveller, the farmhouse of Dawlish Cashin seems utterly isolated from the world. Oh, Adrian, the... do you want a biscuit with your coffee? No, thanks, Auntie. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. I am absolutely positive. Thank you. All right. If you're sure. Yes, I'm sure. All right. <sighs> utterly isolated from the world. Here, in July 1935, comes Richard Lambert in the cause of psychic research, following up on the extraordinary rumours concerning Jeff, the talking mongoose. We present the talking mongoose, a true story of everyday BBC folk. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. Richard Lambert's first move is to interview the farmer, James Irving. Yes, I have seen him. Profile and full face. The colour is yellow, not too pronounced. The tail is long and bushy and tinged with brown. We were first made aware of its presence by its barking, growling, spitting and persistent blowing, which I understand is the procedure of the weasel family. Now, as regards its speaking ability, it did not possess this power for some weeks, but now converses as rationally as most human beings. Finally, Lambert meets the daughter of the house, 15-year-old Voiry. Voiry, that's an unusual name. It's Manx for Mary. Is it? Just not here. Isn't he? He made himself scarce when he heard you were coming, Mr Lambert. Well, that's a pity. Perhaps there is some nexus between the girl Voiry and the mongoose. So Richard Lambert considers the possibility that Jeff is a poltergeist in animal form and Voiry is a medium. First, he didn't say anything. He just locked me in my room, played tricks, threw things. <laughs> but apparently after some time, the mongoose begins to talk. When he first speaks, it is in some foreign tongue. Then he bangs on the walls. The fact is the whole house is panelled and there is a space of some inches between the boards and the walls. Jeff hides behind the panels. I am a freak. I have hands and feet. You approach. Apparently he becomes very perturbed. You saw me, you'd faint. You'd be petrified, mummified, turned into stone or a pillar of salt. I am the holy ghost. Seems Jeff must have attended Sunday school somewhere. You're looking 
Stop looking. Turn your head. Can you ask him why he shouts? I do it for devilment. I am a ghost in the form of a weasel, and I will. He apparently has a real affinity for Voyery, but he seldom speaks to the girl when she's by herself. Turn your head, bastard. I cannot stand your eyes. You can be very vulgar. Now that we've seen the place where it all happened, now that I've followed this extraordinary journey, almost as it were to the ends of the earth, or at least to the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, it's it's hard not to come to the conclusion that the whole thing back in the 1930s was pure make-believe. Huh? Look at Waka Waka. Perhaps it was just a family joke that went too far. Voiry was a, a shy girl, but imagine that this fantasy she shared with her parents, maybe when she was younger, imagine she started talking about it at school and, and then when it got out to the wider world and someone, some school friend or enemy, challenged her, she wouldn't back down. Oh, no. And then the parents went along with it. That's all, because when Lambert turned up to investigate it, the mongoose mysteriously vanished. <laughs> and it only reappeared after he left the island. Hello, everybody. I've come back. I am not a spirit. I am a clever little mongoose. An extra, extra clever mongoose. I was here all the time. You damn snitch! <laughs> Adrian? Yes, I am working. Sorry, did you see... What? There was a little... Um, I thought I saw a little um, creature. Where? It had a bushy tail. Squirrel? It was yellow, yellowish. There was something... It, it was something very odd. No. But there was something... Sorry, Auntie, I've got to get on with this. In September 1935, Richard Lambert publishes an account of his investigation. First, he publishes a story in the BBC magazine The Listener, of which he is the editor. Then he brings out a small booklet called The Haunting of Cashin's Gap. And that, he thinks, will be that. But he's wrong, because of the intervention of Sir Cecil Levita. Sure, sounds Levita. Lieutenant Colonel Sir Cecil Levita, Knight Commander of the Royal Victorian Order, Companion of the Order of the Bath, first saw active service in the Second Matabele War. Mentioned in dispatches, awarded the Queen's Medal with three clasps. ADC to Lieutenant General Sir Baker Russell in the Second Boer War. Never the First War, always looked to the party. In the First World War, served with distinction on the General Staff. Good morning, good morning, the General Staff. Chairman said. of the London County Council. After the war, knighted for public and political services. Basically, Colonel Blimp. No such person exists! Ridiculous caricature! And married to Florence Woodruff the intelligent and attractive Lady Levita. Come on, Dad. It's kind of a coincidence. Lady Levita and Richard Lambert are both on the board of the British Film Institute, and they have a falling out. What about? I'm not entirely sure. And in the end, it doesn't really matter. But I believe that is where this extraordinary story really starts. Sorry, Adrian. Yeah. Are you having a nap? No, no, I, I was just thinking. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to wake uh, you. I was asleep, not properly. It's just you've had an email on your phone, and I thought Auntie, I... Auntie, how many times have I asked you not to look at my phone and not to read my email? But it was from the BBC, and you said that if it was from the BBC, then I must always... What did it say? Shall I get your phone? What did it say? It said... Could you send your script to compliance? What? Compliance? That's what it said. But there is no script. There will be interviews and stuff. Is this your drama documentary? It's a docudrama. Well, what's the difference? Compliance. 
This has never happened before. I'm going out. I need some coffee. I could make you some. I'm going out. In the 1930s, Richard Lambert was on the board of the British Film Institute, and so was Lady Levita. And they fell out about something. It was something to do with bulk buying projectors for schools. It's a bit murky, but I think Lambert thought that someone was trying to make a quick buck, and Lady Levita didn't. Lactose free latte? Oh, thank you, Tor. No banana today. Zoe's going to get you one. Oh, lovely. Thanks. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> they fell out, and whatever it was, it made Sir Cecil Levita angry enough to intervene on his wife's behalf. And Sir Cecil was a member of the establishment in a time when this meant more, a lot more, even than it does today. He believed himself to have, and in fact he did have, as we will see, real power to intervene on his wife's behalf. He invited Lambert's boss at the BBC to lunch at the Carlton Club. Lambert's boss was called... Gladstone Murray. So, Murray, my wife says, and I agree, that this fellow Lambert shouldn't be on the board of the BFI. He's not fit. Do you know what I think? I think he's... At this point, Sir Cecil taps his forehead. This casual gesture will become a crucial piece of evidence. Have you seen his book? He believes in the occult. He believes in a talking mongoose. He's published a book about it. Lactose free latte? Mm -hmm. I beg your pardon? Banana? Banana? Yes. Um, thank you. But my understanding is, as he's one of your men, Murray, you could, I mean, the BBC could put pressure on him to withdraw from the board. Mm. Look here, Murray. The man has got to go. But Sir Cecil has miscalculated. Because Murray is not only Lambert's boss, he's also Lambert's friend and ally. Hmm? And he goes straight to Lambert and tells him what Sir Cecil has said. Lambert immediately sends a letter to Sir Cecil asking for an apology, and when he doesn't get one, he puts the matter in the hands of his solicitors, instructing them to issue a writ for slander. Mm. Does this seem a bit extreme? No, no. Not if you consider what happens next. If you consider what happens next, then it's clear that Lambert has some idea of what he's up against. Sir Cecil has been seeing an old friend who just happens to be the chairman of the BBC. <gasps> And curiously enough, soon after that, Lambert's friend Murray is moved on to a new job in Canada. Mm -hmm. Lambert's new boss at the BBC is Sir Stephen Talens. Mm -hmm. And Sir Stephen is not sympathetic to Lambert's cause. Now look here, Lambert. The thing is, Sir Cecil produced various letters which you had written to Lady Levita, and I have to say that some of these letters were written on BBC notepaper, which produced an unfortunate impression. But why should I not use BBC notepaper? He also mentioned the mongoose. So our chairman, of course, said he would ask you to withdraw your writ. So? But... Why would he do Now, that? Lambert, I understand that you have expressed a desire to see our chairman. Yes. I am afraid Sir John Reith does not consider this advisable at present. Why not? Of course no uh, adverse opinion of you has been entertained, but the feeling is that at some future date it might become desirable for the BBC to withdraw you from the board of the Film Institute. But, but, but that, that's exactly what Sir Cecil wants. My dear Lambert, you must understand that I am expected to do anything I can to encourage a settlement of this affair. We do not want one of our employees figuring prominently in the law courts, do we? You're expecting me to back down? Do think it through, man. If you go to court and lose, you won't be welcome at Broadcasting House, will you? And if you win, there will still be enough scandal to make your position a very difficult one. You expect me to sacrifice my good name and professional reputation for the good of the corporation? I won't do it. I intend to proceed with my action. If you do, you will be making the greatest mistake of your life and you will live to regret it. Here is my advice to you, and I have put it in writing. A. 
Take a week's leave and consider the matter. B, be assured that A, your position with the corporation is not in any way prejudice or damage, but B, if you continue in the course you have chosen, there is serious danger that you might prejudice your position within the corporation because A, you would make the corporation doubt your judgment, and B, you will seem to be placing your own interest in priority to those of the corporation. Come here, come here, come on, mongoose, mongoose, loki, troki, sonjamara, sonjamara, come on, mongoose, mongoose, mongoose. I'm in the bath. It's your phone. Auntie, I asked you not to... I... Producer at the BBC. She wants to work. Oh. Oh, OK. Hang on. Sorry. It's OK. Catherine, hi. OK, Adrian, you're tired. I can't do it. Hello. Sorry, Catherine. That was my aunt. Ridiculous. Sorry. She said you're in the bath. No. At lunchtime. No. Uh, compliance want a meeting. What? They're not happy. What are they not happy about? About the way the BBC is being portrayed in your... You can tell them. They need to mind their own... I'm not going to do that. Why not? Because I'm not prepared to compromise my career for a 30-minute programme, two-thirds of which hasn't even been written yet. Half. I've written half. Just deal with them. Make them go away. They're going to phone you. This is just a friendly warning. Life becomes difficult for Richard Lambert. Everyone knows he's in disgrace. In order to defend himself from Lambert's writ for slander, Sir Cecil Levita has retained the notoriously ruthless solicitors Lewis and Lewis. Lambert does not have the funds to compete with this. But some of his colleagues secretly slip him money to help with his legal fees. Lambert suffers from nervous strain, doubts and fears, distractions and illusions, sleeplessness and indigestion, and all this time he has to keep going into his office at Broadcasting House, where he has become something of a pariah. Catherine? Is that you? I, I wasn't asleep. I was, I was just lying in the hammock, thinking I've reached a bit of an impasse. Putting you through. What? Stand by, please, caller. Who is this? Go ahead, please, Sir John. Hello? Hello? Uh, hello? Hello? This is Sir John Rees. What? Can you hear me? This is Sir John Rees. But you're dead. No, you sound a bit like... A bit like what? A horror? Like a mongoose. Now, look here. I think this has gone far enough, don't you, Lambert? You'd better come in and have a wee chat with me and we can sort this whole business out. Yes, Sir John. Right away. Yes, Sir John. Mr. Lambert, I may tell you that officially, as Director General, it is my view that it would be best for your case to go to court so that the actions of the corporation might be brought into the light and our good name cleared. Yes, right, that, that's what I want. Officially, that is. However, in my individual capacity, I might hold a different opinion. Do you trust me in my personal capacity? Um... I could, in that capacity, offer you advice which might lead to a settlement. Would you like me to undertake unofficially to mediate? Unofficially, but... I realise that you are sensitive to both your public duty and your conscience, Commander. What? I blame myself for not handling this case personally from the beginning. Hello! Sorry, did you say... Perhaps we could dine together and settle the whole thing on an unofficial basis. Unofficial? What is the use of that? Sonjamara, Sonjamara! Mongoose, mongoose, mongoose! You think you can come in here, into my corporation, throwing your weight around, you damn sleech! I'm stuck.
standing outside Broadcasting House. My extraordinary journey has led me here to the very heart of the BBC, and I'm now trying to make sense of my remarkable encounter with... For God's sake! <sighs> Auntie. Adrian? Auntie, I did ask you not to ring Adrian, me while... you've got to help me. What's the matter? There's this creature in the house. Come here! It's only little, but it's very fierce. Auntie? I don't know where it's come from, but it won't go away. Auntie? <laughs> Auntie? Auntie! <laughs> Adrian? Catherine? Come on. I've got to phone my aunt. Later. You've got to come now. But the I... trial's beginning. What? The trial's <laughs> beginning! <laughs> what? <laughs> Silence! <laughs> Silence in court! The plaintiff, while a man of moderate ability, learning and literary skill, is rather highly strung, somewhat credulous, not very well balanced, apt to be inconsistent, not easy to work with or under, and is not a man of great discretion. The issue is simple, Mr. Lambert. Sir Cecil Levita says that you were cracked. I shall make this clear to the jury and then put you in the witness box. Within ten minutes, the jury will have judged for themselves whether you are mad or not. You don't look mad. Thank you. Then I shall cross-examine Levita. I shall put him in a dilemma. I shall ask him two questions. Did you make the statements in question about Mr. Lambert? And... Did you believe them to be true? Whichever way he answers, he will be lost. Call the first witness. Sir Cecil, tell me, why did you interest yourself in this matter? Hmm? Why did you talk to Mr. Lambert's superior at the BBC? I said I had an interest. My wife, you see. Did you say that Mr. Lambert was crazy? Well, I deny that entirely. In talking to Mr. Murray, you touched your head to indicate that Mr. Lambert was of unsound mind. I deny entirely that I hit my head. I have been at times very much troubled with noises in the head, commander and pains, for law, and uh, at that particular luncheon I had a particularly bad day from Jamara. No further questions, my lord. Mr. Justice Swift lives up to his reputation. He will sum up shortly. How do you think it... Do you think he... I like the old man. He has a touch of the 18th century. Dignified, gentle, with flashes of irony. But hush! Here it comes. Mm. Gentlemen of the jury, I think it is a great pity that we should have our time taken up with petty scholars. We have heard a great deal about a certain creature which comes from India, which has hands for front paws and which is liable to stop the paneling and has an extensive repertoire of laughs. Mm -hmm. Sanjamara. But, gentlemen of the jury, I will ask you to bear this in mind. You have no right, because you are cross with somebody, to go and say nasty things about them to their employer. You may think it is a dreadful thing when a man in a public position, thinking that he has been affronted, brings an action in these courts demanding redress for the wrong that has been done him. But that then, behind his back, his employers should be approached and that they should be asked to bring pressure to settle the matter. You should bear these things in mind when considering what damages, if any, should be awarded for the plaintiff. For law. <laughs> Does that mean we've won? Oh, yes, if there's talk of damages. Damages? You mean Sir Cecil will pay me? I should hope so. I hadn't thought of that. Sir Cecil has. He's put up £100 for that eventuality. Did he? £100? Oh, I could do with that. That would keep us for a year. Would it? Oh, dear me. Gentlemen, your verdict? Mm. Thank you, gentlemen. The jury has reached a unanimous verdict. They find that Sir Cecil Levita spoke the words alleged, that they were not true, that he had no right to speak them, that they were spoken maliciously, and that the damages are to be £7,500. <gasps> 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 
thousand. And five hundred. Never need to work again. Oh, that's lucky, because you'll never get any more commissions now. What? What on earth prompted you to tell a story like that at a time like this? Because they commissioned it? At a time when the BBC is under attack from all sides? It's always under attack. When is it not under attack? If, if it's not the Luftwaffe, then it's Netflix, isn't it? When the licence fee is under threat? Actually, the Charter was up for review when the Mongoose case came to court and there were questions in the House about the Mongoose, but guess what? They still renewed the Charter. When young people are turning into Oh, to... don't talk to me about young people. They don't listen to Radio 4, do they? For mother? They don't say that about gardening, do they? They don't say, oh, the young people aren't gardening. The whole multi-billion pound gardening industry is under threat because young people aren't buying secateurs. Oh, oh, oh. Except as presents for their grandparents, but everybody knows without even bothering to think about it that normal people don't start gardening until they're in their 40s. And exactly the same is true of... Sancha Mara! Mongos, mongos, mongos! Adrian? No, I wasn't asleep. I'm sorry. Not asleep. I didn't mean to disturb you. Your phone's ringing. Auntie, are you all right? Yes, thank you, Adrian. That's very kind of you to ask. OK. I'd, I'd better answer this. Of course. Catherine? Adrian? That is you. Yeah, that, that, that is you are Catherine. Are you OK? I, I was just... Resting, thinking, doing some thinking. We've had the results of the commissioning round. Oh, yes? You put in a proposal for something called The Talking Mongoose? Uh, yes. A drama documentary? Yes, of course, I, I remember, so... Status rejected. Oh, thank God. <laughs> The Talking Mongoose by Robin Brooks. Adrian was played by Patrick Marlowe. Auntie by Gillian Kelly. Catherine by Helen Vine. Jeff the Mongoose by Jasmine Nazir Jones. The Talking Mongoose was produced and directed by Fiona McAlpine and was an Allegra production for the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you,